Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, the first speaker of the day is uh, Yannick Zimmerman. He will talk about uh, do triumphal twists survive quantization? Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Yannick. I'm the PhD student of Stein van Tongeren. He wasn't able to make it this year because he became a father two months ago. Um, but I'm pretty sure he's not sitting at home like watching the stream. So, uh, hey Stein, uh, hey everyone else. Um, in our group in, in Berlin, we are looking at the deformations of the standard ADS CFT theories. And then in particular, we're interested in how to extend our knowledge about them into the quantum machine. What I'm now going to do today is tell you one of our adventures we, we um, experienced in that topic. <coughs> And to, to set the scene, let me show you a map of the ADS CFT correspondence. So, <clears throat> what we have here is um, a map where on the left hand side, on this side, we have Young Mills theory with uh, yeah, the classical gauge theory or like lo a low loop expansion on that side. The uh, Hethoff coupling is going to the right. And then on the right hand side, we have string theory with classical string theory on the right-hand edge. And then as we go to the center, we go towards the quantum theory. So you see that the quantum theory is kind of connecting the two classical theories on both sides. Um, now the y-axis, that's the uh, number of colors in the Young-Mills theory or the number of handles in the string theory. Um, and I'm going to focus now exclusively on the lower part where the number of colors is infinite. So we have the planar limit, or we have no string interactions at all so with a free string. Good, so the areas of interest are now the free classical string down here, then it's quantum version as soon as we quantize it, so as soon as we go to uh, higher interactions, uh, string tensions, and then the super young Mills classical regime. However, I'm going to focus mostly on this part here and this part here. In particular, I'm going to focus on ADS5 times S5 with uh, the symmetry algebra PSU 2 to 4. This is going to be an important object. Good. <clears throat> so people started like, yeah, people studied this theory and the young, oops, the young Wills theory. And um, they uh, like because the planar theory down here is integrable we have some very nice results here we can actually calculate uh, a lot of quantities on both sides of the correspondence and match the two theories what i'm now interested in is deformations of the theory so we want to look at um, deformations i'm going to focus on deformations on the string theory and for these deformations people usually mostly studied the classical theories, so the classical string, the classical super young mills theory, but there's uh, way less work on the quantum theory connecting the two. Now, so the classical theory that's kind of known, that's our, like where we are at home, it's also easy to do. And then the quantum theory, that gets a bit more, more unknown. Um, Good, so we want to study deformations of ADS5. The deformations I'm looking at are young Baxa deformations. These are deformations of the two-dimensional sigma model of the free string. They preserve integrability, so we still have our, all of our nice tools of integrability. And they're characterized by solutions to the classical young Baxa equation. Now there's two different, um, two different classes of, of solutions you can look at are two different young Baxa equations the inhomogeneous one and the homogeneous one. <clears throat> the inhomogeneous uh, Baxter equation gives then rise to the inhomogeneous deformations. They're also called eta deformations. These have been studied a few years ago and now received renewed interest because we finally managed to find an actual um, string background, so a supergravity background in there. And then last year, together with uh, Stein and my collaborator, Fiona Seibold, we calculated the S matrix for that theory. The inhomogeneous 
deformations, they give rise to a trigonometric quantum deformation of the symmetry algebra. Whereas now, on the other hand, the homogeneous deformations um, from the homogeneous young box equation, classical young box equation, they give rise to a Drinfeld twist of the symmetry algebra. And this is now also what I'm going to focus on, the Drinfeld twist. And now in particular, don't want to look at all homogeneous deformations, but I want to look at another subclass, the abelian deformations in there. Uh, what that exactly is, I will explain in a second. Good. So now let's look at again at this map of the correspondence for these abelian, for these homogeneous deformations. What's known there, what's not known, and so on. So we have the the classical area here, and there is like yeah this connection to Drinfeld twist that that's uh, kind of well established here. And then there's a couple of well-known examples. So I think the beta and gamma deformation that's the most most famous example in this class, it's an abelian young baxter deformation. And then there's also the, the dipole-like or Schrodinger background deformations in here. Now, on the other side of the correspondence, we expect or it's conjectured that we get non-commutative super, super young Mills theory there. And now in the center, as soon as we go from this well-known, you know, the kind of our homeland of classical strings, into this unknown area, into this uncharted land. Um, I'd like to compare to some kind of uncharted mm -hmm. forest where we don't really know much. There has been some work and one I want to highlight in particular is this one by Ann Kim Lee, something I'm going to build on that's trying to, or like that's going into this unknown area, but it has standard only for one particular kind of deformation. And our work now is going to, yeah, we will be following that trail, we're going to, Mm, do the same, but extend it and calculate the whole quantum theory or in particular the S matrix for a bigger class of deformations. Okay, so, so much for setting the scene. Now, let me give you a quick overview of the structure of the talk. Um, at first, I'm going to explain you the, the classical, like our, our well-known land here, the classical theory, going to define the, the classical deformed string. And then I'm going to tell you what the Drinfeld twist is, what we expect, like there's some kind of fairy tale, what the quantum theory should look like. And I'm going to explain you that. And then after that, after we got this story that kind of gets us going, we actually start our expedition into the quantum regime. We want to calculate the S matrix for the theories. However, to do that, we need to do some gauge fixing that will introduce some conceptual difficulties into our whole picture. Um, and then in the end, I will come to a resolution how we actually, like what actually happens with the S matrix. Good, so much for that, so much for setting the scene. Uh, so much for the introduction. Now let's get started with the classical regime. I will introduce the young Baxter deformations and then the Drinfeld twists after that. Good, young Baxter deformations. As I said, the deformations of the 2D Sigma model, we can, you know, some of you may know this corset formulation for the string on ADOS 5, you can introduce the deformations through that. But there's also a nicer or like more insightful formulation. Now for my purposes, if you just look at the bosons, you can write the whole thing like this with the action here, with the string tension front, then the world sheet integral, with the world sheet metric and world sheet epsilon. And now the important bit is over here. So we have the, the string fields X and they couple to the background. And now this tilted quantities, that's the deformed background. For the deformed background, we have a, a metric and the B field. And the metric and B field, we get them by just taking the undeformed metric, inverting it, adding an R matrix, and then inverting back. This will then give the the new deformed, battery, new deformed metric of our deformed space, our deformed ADS space. Now this R matrix, what is that? The R matrix consists of two, two elements of the symmetry 
algebra, the PSU algebra. We combine them into one matrix, and this matrix, ha matrix has to solve the classical young Baxter equation. Now you see here, this is equal to zero. So this is the homogeneous young Baxter equation leading to homogeneous deformations. If there would be something uh, non-zero here, we get the inhomogeneous equations. Now for this young Baxter equation, there is a variety of solutions. I'm going to focus now exclusively on abelian solutions. Abelian solutions that uh, take the form uh, of this, like some number gamma here, that's a deformation parameter. And then we have the important bit A batch B, so an anti-symmetric product of A and B, where A and B commute with each other and the elements of the symmetry algebra PSU. Good, so this is the important form of our R matrix. It will always look like this. It will always look like A batch B with two generators. Good, so after now, yes, a question. Can I just ask, can it, uh, are A and B allowed to be fermionic? I don't know that's um, So this is a good question. Like I will now only explicitly discuss bosonic generators here, but I'm actually planning to look into fermionic generators in the future. Good, um, okay, so. I build deformations. Now, this was a very general story for young Baxter deformations. Now I want to explain the uh, ADS5 string. I'm going to discuss it in global coordinates. Um, these take the form where we have for the ADS5 part, three, what I call angular coordinates, T, Psi1, Psi2, then two radial coordinates, rho and X. These are not so important. Then for the sphere part, we have another three angles. Uh, phi, zero, one, and two, and another two radii. I call these angles, the green angles, the green uh, coordinates angle angles because our model is shift invariant in these, so there's some kind of rotational variance here. And uh, the good thing is if you now have the shift invariance, we can look at the shift generators. And these shift generators are exactly the Catan generators of PSU. So Catan generators, they're commuting all with each other. That's also quite obvious from the fact that these generators just produce shifts in these angular coordinates. So we just change each of the variables by like a small amount and uh, changing T of course, and, and I don't know, changing T and changing phi zero, for example, that does interact with each other. So these generators commute. Now, because they're commuting, we can use them as our main building blocks for our building deformations. So these are our six generators, uh, the node generators always with this P. Now, this is now almost a set of generators I'd like to use for our deformations. However, I need to, I want to do another coordinate transformation in preparation for our gauge fixing later on. So I want to switch to light cone coordinates. That's the first thing where I take um, the time coordinate from ADS and then an angular coordinate from the sphere, combine it into X plus and X minus. And I have the corresponding P plus, P minus from the shift generators. Then uh, a second change of variables will be to I switch to eigenfunctions of our remaining shift generators. So I take the exponential of the remaining angles. I call that Z and Y. This exact form here is not super important for the general story. But I need to mention it here to make sure that we now all on the same side that we use this new coordinates, x plus, x minus, x plus, x minus, and then four sets and four y's. <clears throat> now, the generators that I will use for our building deformations are now these six here. This is kind of our expedition team that we will send off to, to venture into this unknown territory, into this unknown forest. We have a group of six and they actually split into like the main group. These are the green ones here. And then there will be two outsiders, P plus and P minus, which um, as we will see later, have some interaction with the gauge fixing procedure. Okay, good. So this is our expedition team. And before I now 
go on and continue into this quantization, this SMX calculation. I want to make a few side remarks just to connect with some other things you may know. <clears throat> so at first I want to discuss a few examples of abelian deformations. The most famous one is the gamma deformation or beta deformation, which gives the lunar Malta center background. Um, the R matrix here takes all of the three sphere uh, coordinates or so the shift generators for that and turns it into an R matrix. And then there's also this work by Ahn Kim Lee, which I mentioned earlier, which studied the S matrix for one of these gamma deformations, but it only picked out this particular deformation where we have uh, phi one and phi two and notice here that phi zero, which went into the light cone, light cone coordinates, it doesn't appear here. So this, this kind of belongs to them, the, belongs to the main group of, of generators that I was mentioning earlier. Good, then another side remark, as you may know, this uh, gamma deformations, these are, these are equal to um, TST transformation. And this is actually a general result that was shown by, um, by Stein and by David Austin, that's also sitting here. But actually that paper, I think it's the, I like, it's a paper, the work related paper I read that I liked the most in my two years of study so far. So good job. <laughs> um, so the general thing is that if you have an R matrix, which for example, takes this form of uh, P51 and P52, then it's equal to a TST transformation where we T dualize in phi one, then we shift phi two by something proportional to phi one, and then we T dualize back. Good, then uh, a last uh, remark, and now the last equivalence is that if we have our young abelian deformations or TST transformations, we can also represent them by an undeformed string with twisted boundary conditions, however. I'm not going to dive into much detail here, just want to mention that that's uh, a way that we use to double check our final result in the end. Good, so then back to the main story. <clears throat> Now, so I explained the string, how we deform it, what kind of abelian deformations and R matrices we pick. Now, let me get to the Drinfeld twist. So a Drinfeld twist um, of the algebra, or actually a Drinfeld twist always happens for the bi-algebra. A bi-algebra, a Hopf bi-algebra of an al uh, symmetry algebra, that's how it acts, like, to sum it up in one sentence, that's how it acts in, uh, on multi-particle states. Uh, Leander had uh, like a bit more definitions and more details about that on his slides, but I'm not going to dive much into that. The important part of this, this bi-algebra construction is that there's always um, a Drinfeld twist that we, that we can do, and that is if we take a matrix F here, which has certain algebraic conditions on it, we can use it to twist the whole algebra, uh, to twist the co-product, for example, and all the other quantities in it. And then the final result will be that the ACE matrix of the new twisted model will, will take this twisted form here, um, twisted by this F matrix. Now, what's important here is that this S matrix in here, this is the S matrix for the full PSU symmetry group. So this is a hypothetical object that we usually don't really know for our models because usually we always have to do a gauge fixing that will mess a little bit with the symmetry algebra, um, something that we will see later on. Good, so now how, this, how, how does this Drinfeld twist now relate to our homogeneous and Baxa deformations? That comes through another equivalence. We have that for each solution of the homogeneous classically and Baxa equation, we can always construct an F matrix which such a, satisfies the properties to be such a Drinfeld twist. And it actually also goes the other way around. If we have an F, F matrix here, we can always retrieve a solution to the classical and Bax equation from that. An example for abelian uh, deformations, for abelian solutions of the form AHB is that we take, uh, we get this usual twist form with an F that's just the exponential of this AHB.
Okay, so that means now if we take our building information with, um, yes, a question. Well, it's a very stupid question, actually. So here you say that to get the doing fault twist, you just exponentiate uh, the R matrix. So what if I exponentiate the uh, general solution that doesn't give me a twist? The which solution? The, the one from the inhomogeneous and Baxter equation. Um, yeah, I would say it doesn't give, like, because this F matrix has certain algebraic conditions on it, on it these I think they won't be met. I'm not 100%, like I'm not, I don't know, I'm 60% sure that this is the case. 60, okay. But yes. Wait, maybe you should write, you should write down. You know, you should write down the condition that this matrix F has to fulfill in order to be a doing so. This is a simple answer to the question. So what is this condition? Uh, you mean the conditions on so this F matrix? Uh, no, I can't do this right now. Excuse me, what was that? You write paper about green so twist that you are not able to write conditions for F matrix to be green so twist. Um, yes, and I'm okay, in this talk right now. Okay, good. Um, good, so we have now a relation between the Gambaxa deformation and the Grinfeld twist. Now, a last side remark before we go on to the S matrix calculation about the, the conjectured gauge dual theory. So we know now that for our defor deformed, homogeneously deformed ADS5, we have a symmetry algebra, which takes this Grinfeld twisted PSU form. Now we can ask the question, what do we need to do to the super young Mills theory on the, on the gauge theory side to get a similarly deformed um, symmetry algebra? It turns out that putting the whole super young Mills theory on a non-commutative space time does the trick here. So we take non-commutative Minkowski space. Uh, a quick example here is that if we, if we now switch to Poincaré coordinates for our ADS space, and have an R matrix, which is just um, a shift generator for X1 and one for X2. This is conjectured to be dual to super young mills on a space time with the commutator between X1 and X2 non zero. Gets more complicated for more complicated R matrices, but this is just a quick example as a side, side note. Good. So now we. I introduced the abelian deformations of the string A batch B. I introduced our expedition team, like the six generators that we want to use, that we want to take the generators from. Um, we have now this whole story about the, the Drinfeld twist and this expectation that the, the full PSU S matrix should take this Drinfeld twisted form. But now, as we now go to the quantum regime, as we want to calculate the S matrix, it turns out that the story about this Trinchel twisted S matrix is not so easy because in practice, we always have to do a gauge fixing that will um, interact or that, yeah, that will just interact with the Trinchel twist and how it will interact with that. Um, that will now be part of the second, uh, will be content of the second part. Okay, so our steps in calculating the S matrix is we do the deformation first, then we do the light cone gauge fixing, and then we calculate the S matrix. This uniform light cone gauge, what does it look like? It's basically, we said X plus equal to tau and P minus, that's the conjugate momentum of X minus equal to one. And um, one thing, that this does in particular is it reduces the symmetry algebra from our PSU224 to two copies of SU22. It's very similar to the story that Alessandro was mentioning for the ADS3 case. 
Now, after we did this, we fixed x plus x minus. We kind of removed that from the excitation spectrum. We fixed them to a certain value, and then we can calculate the S matrix for the remaining coordinates y and z. Excuse me, the background Yes, it's a good point. Um, so whether we can always fix a light cone gauge for a deformed background, we actually need to make sure that our deformation preserves the, um, the isometry properties of X plus and X minus that are needed for this light cone gauge. So we restricted the set of um, generators that we use for our, our matrix. Just, should just preserve the free wave equation for light cone variable. I agree with you, Amit. Okay, I think we, we, I would like, I would actually like to discuss that after the talk, just to know this perspective that I'm not aware of. Good. Um, okay, so now to give us a starting point for the calculation, let me quickly introduce the undeformed matrix for undeformed ADS5. Uh, the actual form is not very important. I just want to mention this. This was also a word that's almost 15 years old uh, by now. And um, we have here the, the T matrix or so the tree level S matrix. And I will call this whole object T0. Good. Now, so everything is set up. We can start our S matrix calculation. Steps, steps are we the form with members of this expedition team here, take pairs from that. Then we fix the light cone gauge and then we calculate the S matrix. However, we're going to calculate now is this SU22 squared S matrix. So the S matrix for the gauge model, gauge fix model. Um, and then this is of course a different object to the S matrix for the full PSU symmetry algebra. Now, the question that we kind of have to ask ourselves is here, what, what happens to this Grinfeld twist for this SU22 S matrix? Is it still acting in the same way? Is it acting different? And one hint that we can already get from, already get from just looking at this slide here is that because we calculate the S matrix for this Y and for the Z coordinates, which depend on the angles phi one and phi two, and the psi angles for these green generators for the main team, we actually, it's, it's kind of easy to guess what, how these generators act. They, these generators act by shifting these angles. So we should be able to figure out very easily how they act on these Ys and Zs. But now for P plus and for P minus, and this is kind of the important twist, we, we fixed X plus and uh, P minus to certain values. So just shifting the, the coordinates corresponding to P plus and P minus won't be that easy anymore. They're not really part of the excitations of the S matrix. So we expect some kind of complications then. How in the end then these generators act and what kind of twist if there's still a Grinfeld twist that I'm, I'm going to discuss it now. But I want to start with the simple case with this main group generators. So what happens if you take deformation that just takes generators from that main group? Good, so we take A and B from this main group. We assemble them into our R matrix, A, B, B, we deform, the gauge fix, and then we calculate the perturbative tree level result. And it turns out that the deformed matrix T gamma is equal to the undeformed T matrix T zero and then just this gamma average B. Where A and B, one of these generators, they act on the particle states by, yeah, basically because we switch to, to eigenfunctions, we just get like certain eigenvalues here. For example, for, for phi one, we get a minus one for, Y11 one one and for a Y22 two two, a plus one. And for the other generators, it basically looks the same just for different, um, co with different coordinates. Okay, so we get this 
uh, T gamma is T zero plus AHB. And now we had this expectation from the Drinfeld twist for the full S matrix. And yes, it turns out if you take an F matrix of this exponential form, exponential of AHB, and um, plug it in here, expand, and uh, look at the tree level part, this is exactly giving us this form. So our, our result matches the expectation from the Drinfeld twist. So everything is nice here. Everything just goes through as expected. The S matrix is Drinfeld twisted in the end. This also matches what Ahn Kim Lee from 2013 for this very, for, yeah, for one of these twists from our simple main group. Okay, so everything is nice here. Now let's turn to the two outlier outliers. First P plus, what happens with P plus? I take A equal to P plus here just to fix something and then B one of the elements from the main group. Our, the whole calculation will be now the same calculate a perturbative tree level result. And it turns out that also here, the result is something like the form T matrix is unformed T matrix plus AHP, where A is P plus. However, now the action of this P plus is basically, or it's the action of the world sheet Hamiltonian. So if we act with P plus on a particle with certain momentum P, we just get the energy of the particle. Now, What's the reason for that? That's quite easy to argue. P plus, that's the dual coordinate, the dual generator to X plus. If we now do the gauge fixing procedure and set X plus equal to tau, then P plus becomes a dual to tau, a dual to tau to the world sheet time. That's just a world sheet Hamiltonian. So also in here, we get this nice Greenfield twisted structure that we expect. However, with the only difference that now P plus is just acting as the world sheet Hamiltonian. Good, so we have the mind group, we have P plus. Now let's turn to P minus. And now, yes, we take again A equal to P, min P minus and B is now any of the remaining five generators. To the simplify this discussion a bit here on the slides, I'll just pick B equal to P phi one as an example. We can, however, we can generalize everything to all of the other generators. Again, just remember you, if you look at uh, Y11, for example, and act with P51 on that, we get a minus one. For Y22, we get a plus one. For everything else, we get a zero. Now, we can do the whole calculation. We deform the gauge fix, we calculate the, the uh, tree level S matrix. And then the whole result gets a bit more difficult, more complicated. Just giving you two examples of two scattering processes. If we scatter Y11 and y, uh, Y11 twice, we get a T matrix, which is now of the form where the deformed T matrix, T gamma, with it now printed uh, the explicit momentum dependency of particle one and particle two. And now this deformed T matrix is equal to the undeformed T matrix, however, with uh, the momentum of particle one shifted by gamma by minus gamma and the momentum of particle two also shifted by minus gamma. For scattering with y11 and y22, we get basically the same only with this sign here inverted. And this is now relating to the fact that the eigenvalues of y11, eigenvalue here is minus one and the eigenvalue here is plus one. So we always have something like the eigenvalue times gamma as the deformation or the shift. This is the general res result that we found that the form T matrix is the underformed T matrix with the momenta shifted by gamma times and then the eigenvalue of the particle scattering. Good, so this is the tree level result. Now we can just generalize that to the all loop S matrix. We say that it will take the same form, the deformed S matrix, the undeformed S matrix with shifted momenta. And now I want to give a little, a quick proof for that. Um, 
which follows the same reasoning as we had before. We have these three steps. And now I'm going to replace the, this deformation here and the light cone gauge fixing by something else. Let me just skip through that. So the deformation, as I mentioned previously, I'll just replace it by a TST transformation. So a T dualize an X minus, then I shift and then I T dualize back. The light cone gauge fixing, I'll replace that. This is uh, also a nice result. We can always replace the light cone gauge fixing where we set X plus and P minus to certain values by a T dualization and then setting X plus to tau and X minus now to sigma. And then here we calculate the S matrix. So now you can see in the center here, we have two T dualization steps. These just cancel each other so we can get rid of them. And then we can also just reorder the whole thing. We T dualize first. Now I move the fixing of X plus and X minus to the top. And the shift now becomes, it's not anymore shift by gamma X minus, but now it's a shift by gamma sigma because I move this fixing of X, X minus through that. Then the end we calculate the S matrix. So tutorialization, fixing, shifting, S matrix. The first two, ste two steps, that's just our gauge fixing again. And now this means that if we have this shift here, that we can also rewrite because our angular coordinates, they are all isometry, so they only we only have derivative terms of that in the Lagrangian. We can rewrite a shift by gamma sigma into a shift of the sigma derivative by gamma. And now we have our uniform model, we gauge fixed and shift that. So that means that our gauge fixed deformed Lagrangian is just our gauge fixed undeformed Lagrangian with this replacement. And this repa replacement in momentum space is just replacing the momentum of that particle by the momentum plus something in proportional to gamma. And then we need to add this extra eigenvalue here just to make sure that only um, like the fields that contain 5.1 are actually deformed. Okay, so our gauge fixed Lagrangian is just the undeformed Lagrangian with a shifted momentum. And now we can go through the whole Feynman diagrams procedure and it turns out that in the end, uh, this replacement just carries through. We get an S matrix with shifted momentum, just as we, as we expected. Good, so this means now our deformation with P minus is quite special. It's not giving a Drinfeld twist, but it's giving uh, an S matrix that is the undeformed S matrix with shifted momentum. Okay, so I'm almost done. It we kind of went out, we looked at the quantum theory, figured out what happens to this Greenfield twist, it mostly survives. In this one case, it doesn't really survive. It takes a bit of a different form. Now, the last thing I want to discuss is a little problem we encountered in repeating the same procedure in Poincaré coordinates. Um, and I'm presenting this here because yeah, we got stuck at some point and I'd be happy to get some input uh, for that, if you have any ideas, feel free to chat me up. So the problem we encountered here is we wanted to repeat the same thing in Poincaré coordinates. In particular, we wanted to study deformations of this form px1, px2. Um, this whole calculation is most natural in um, ADS light cone gauge. So we pick our light cone directions purely in ADS, and then. If you want to calculate an S matrix, it only becomes massive if you pick a particular classical solution, the so-called null cusp solution, which takes the square root form here, and in particular depends on the Volge coordinates. If you now take this classical solution, want to calculate the S matrix, you have to expand around that, look at fluctuations here. And we get a problem because our Lagrangian becomes Volge dependent, it becomes dependent on tau and sigma. Now, in the undeformed case, the original authors, they found a clever field redefinition and world sheet redefinition that gets rid of tau and sigma. So we have an undeformed, uh, if we Lagrangian again, that's not dependent on the world sheet anymore. We can do the whole S matrix calculation. 
The problem now, as soon as we deform this whole Lagrangian and then do the gauge fixing and this expansion and so on, we were not able to find a, a few different redefinition anymore, which freezes off this world sheet dependence. So this just doesn't work anymore. And as soon as we have a Lagrangian, it's world sheet dependent. It's like really difficult, almost impossible to calculate an S matrix from that. So attacking it from the direct S matrix population through the Lagrangian was a problem. But then we also looked at the other side. We looked at this expected Rinfeld twist structure and we figured out that already there we have a bit of a problem in the interpretation of the whole twist because our excitations of this, of this model, they are not eigenstates of px1 and px2. So the generators from the R matrix. So it's difficult to figure out how the Strinfeld twist actually acts. And then even, even more complicated is the fact that um, px and uh, px1 and px2, they become complicated through these field redefinitions that we do up here. And then um, we don't even know how to rep represent it any, anymore properly. Okay, so this, is, this was this, a really quick summary of that. Um, of course, there's way more, way more detail here to be discussed. If you have any ideas, uh, feel free to just chat me up in the coffee break afterwards. Good, so I'm almost done. Let's, let, give, let me give a quick summary. So the context was that for abelian and homogeneous Ambaxter deformations, we expect that uh, the symmetry algebra gets Grinfeld twisted, and in particular, the, the full PSU S matrix gets Grinfeld twisted. However, now we had to gauge fix to actually calculate an S matrix, which reduces to the SU22 squared model and S matrix. And we studied how, yeah, what happens to that. And it turns out that for all the deformations that do not include the light cone coordinates, everything is fine. We still have the string for twisted structure. For P plus, we get uh, that it basically acts as the Hamiltonian, the voltage Hamiltonian. And then this last P minus case, which was the most involved one, that acts by shifting the momentum of the undeformed matrix, plus matrix. Good, that's it. Then just uh, two last comments about possible further directions. So I was telling you we have this class of homogeneous and black deformations, and I was just looking at the billion subcase. And even there, just a, a, a small subset of all possible abelian solutions that you could um, come up with. Now, all these deformations from like a classical first principle perspective, they are all integrable. They should give integrable theories as matrices. However, because we need to do this light cone gauge fixing, we can only like really calculate S matrices, which keep our light cone gauge in intact, which doesn't mess with that. So we only know the S matrix for a small subset of these integrable deformations. Figuring that out, I mean, of course, in the end, having a mass matrix, which doesn't require us to gauge fix at all, which is like very general, that would be the dream, but I don't know if that's reachable anytime soon. Now, the last point, talking again about the corresponding um, super young Mills theory is, yeah, we're expecting there to be this non-commutative super young Mills theory. And now we can take that theory, we actually can do quantum calculations and match the whole thing. And this is what my colleague Tamaya is also here today is currently working on. Great, um, that's it for me. That's it for my adventure. Thank you very much and please ask questions. Hello, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, my question is about, uh, let me see if I can phrase it. So you make a choice of Lycan gauge and you also choose your R matrix. And somehow you say, um, 
for my choice of lightning gauge, I consider all possible R all possible R matrices of the type that you were you were considering. Um, however, one can imagine that you might choose your lightning gauge depending on your choice of R matrix to sort of. Uh, and what I mean is, you could, depending on your choice of R matrix, you could choose different angles to like to engage mix in. Yes. So I would somehow expect there to be some equivalence between, I wouldn't expect there to be a complete, there would be some equivalence amongst the R matrices, uh, the scattering matrices that you were finding some way of relating. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. I mean, I picked from a like to engage this phi zero direction, but of course, I could just. Like I have these three angular directions, three Cartan directions in the sphere, and I can just relabel them. So there's some kind of yeah equivalence. You could just shuffle them around and call them differently. That's that's right. So for me, it's it was mainly an issue of just giving them different names, and then the whole procedure looks the same. But how the angles of the ADS? You can, I imagine that I, well, I, would, I would have guessed that using an R matrix that combines one of these generators that shifts the angle of the ADS with as if that angle, as if the angles of the S3 will follow the same recipe. Um, can you uh, repeat that, please? Uh, apart from this piece, uh, this piece that shifts your, what you call the angles of the S5. You also yes. have those generators that shift the angles, what you call the angles of the ADS5. And you're asking whether... Yes. Uh, what happens with an R matrix that has uh, this, these two generators, one of the ADS5 ah, yeah. and one of the S5? I would imagine that you can apply the same recipe you have presented here. Yes, yeah, so it turns out that, um, so for example, the, the gamma deformation that's taking just angles from the S5, and now the question is, what happens if I take one angle from S5 and one from ADS5? Does anything special happen here? Because you're kind of mixing the two, two geometries. And it turns out that nothing special really happens. It just, the DS matrix just looks as, exactly the same, just with the generator switched. I have a bit of a different action of these generators, but I still have this Grinfield twisted structure. So there isn't really any, anything special uh in in mixing the two geometries i can also completely take ads angles everything looks the same here it's only really the slide cone directions the light cone gauge that introduces any complications thank you or if i add one thing here so that's actually an interesting point if we connect to this gauge dual theory well, because in the super theory, we have a clear distinction between the, the ADS part, which becomes the, the Minkowski or conformal um, symmetry algebra, and the S5 part that becomes the, the internal, the asymmetry part of the algebra. And then if we look at the whole formalism on that side, that's what Tamaya is doing, there's actually a difference between the, the S, S5 part and the ADS5 part or the asymmetry and the conformal symmetry, and we have to treat things totally different there. So it's in, it was interesting to me that in, in my picture in the string theory, it doesn't make any difference and it all looks the same. Uh, I have a question yes. on this uh, formations involving P minus. Uh, can you define uh, momentum shifting generators and formally rewrite the deformance matrix still in terms of a sort of Greenfield twist, at least formally? Uh, yes, so the question was can we, like shifting the momentum that just looks like the action of some kind of derivative operator, now can we define? Uh, something that looks like a Drinfield twist with like a formal shift generator, like a derivative operator. And I was trying to do that. It was also the first thing that came to my mind. But the main problem is that Drinfield twist is a Drinfield twist is anti-symmetric in generators. But here for this shift shifting of momentum, we have like some kind of symmetric action. So that didn't work out. I wasn't able to do that. Hey, yeah, something very general. Um, I was a bit, bit confused by how you said you calculate the all loop S matrix. I 
I heard like you use, you go through fine line diagrams, but isn't that like a perturbative thing to do? Like, how did you match the, the all loop, uh, the all loop expectation with uh, computation? You mean like this last step of going from the gauge fixed Lagrangian to the S matrix? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, Yes, I mentioned here that I used like this whole Feynman diagram procedure, but what I really did is I was just looking at this uh, like Feynman path integral with the exponential of the action. And so I looked at not actually all the details of the Feynman diagram procedure, but just at the kind of the general algorithm that goes through that and then kind of did all loop levels at once. Okay. We have a question by Vlad or Ivo, please, Vlad. Thank you. Um, one question is um, why you're so interested uh, in computing uh, Poincaré as matrix? Because Poincaré patch is kind of only a patch. It's not global. These are not global uh, parameterization of ADS space. So you expect some trouble coming in. So. So we are interested in using this point career patch because we are interested in using R matrices of this form. Mm -hmm. We're interested in these R matrices because these are very easy to match to the super young Mills theory, like non-commutative super young Mills theory that I was mentioning. This is like a very easy thing to calculate in super young Mills theory. And now studying this R matrix because it has like this X1 and X2, which are Poincaré patch coordinates. We also, it's most natural to study that in the Poincaré patch. Well, I mean that if you have, for instance, uh, the all loop S matrix, uh, you can expand it without any problem at one loop and match it to the young means S matrix and global coordinates as well, right? So I don't see any immediate reason why you should uh, do this in Poincaré coordinates if you want even to compare it to young Mills theory. Can you, can you repeat? Take, take, take all loop S matrix uh, computed uh, in a standard way. I mean, in global coordinates, uh, take a one loop limit. Uh, that means coupling constant to zero. And you will find one loop S matrix of Young-Mills theory uh, computed uh, in Young-Mills, right? That's how things match. In, in the non-deformed case, I'm talking about non-deformed case, but apparently, Something happens for non-commutative young mills probably, which prevents you from doing this. And that is my question. What is exactly the obstacle to repeat this? I'm not sure if it's a question to you. Maybe this is a question to people who are doing uh, non-commutative young calculation. Yes. I, I think it is because they want um, some kind of uh, uh, you mean that on the young mill site it's kind of difficult to realize uh, this deformation if you uh, if you don't do this uh, in a way uh, which matches Poincaré uh, description I, I don't know but Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I can also add a comment uh, just quickly. Mm -hmm. um, right, so the, the problem really happens upon deformation. You're you're completely right that in the undeformed case you can you can do this as you wish. Um, mm -hmm. But the the issue is really yeah if we want to study this deformation, mm -hmm. we could even ask the question if we just want to study it in, in, in on the string theory side, mm -hmm. if we do this deformation of the string sigma model in global coordinates, we will get global time dependence and so we can no longer fix a light concave. So in that sense, that's one way of seeing that conceptually there's something funny going on if you try to do this in the global ADS coordinates and a light, con and a light concave X ma S matrix there. Another way to phrase it is if you have this um, PSU2, uh, if you have the SU2 plus two squared S matrix, how does, X, how does this shift generator of X1 act on it? You don't know because it's, it's this non-linearly realized symmetries. Yeah. And the way to answer that would be to do a perturbative computation. But to do that perturbative computation, you need to gauge fix, and you can't gauge fix. So it's all tied in together. Um, so the only way to do it is to 
try and, and, and find an appropriate light point gauge that's compatible with the R matrix. And that requires going to Poincaré coordinates and picking a Poincaré light point gauge. So okay. I think that's yeah. appropriate. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, I have a follow-up to Sibyl's question. Um, just to quickly check, this argument you have about um, for loop, um, this is a formal argument, or do you also have some understanding of, um, or some statement or argument why, I mean, if you do a perfect competition, you would need to regularize, I mean, the path control is not really well defined, um, why regularization would not, is guaranteed not to spoil this argument. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just making a formal argument. I didn't think about regularization and all these related issues. So if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.